to say it's nice to be with you again in Garnavello. I know that there are many men who are able to preach the gospel here, but if we can help in some small way, we're glad to do so. So please remember these meetings as announced every night through Friday night. Come back if you can. Let's ask God's blessing before we read. Our gracious God in heaven, how grateful we are to understand the purposes of God towards mankind. Father, we're thankful for precious words that the Lord Jesus could speak to a man whose ear was open to hear that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our Father, how true these words are even yet today. And our prayer is that ears will be open to hear and that hearts will be open to receive this message and be willing to put their confidence in the one 
who hung on an awful cross to bear his sin. Father, we give thanks for the opportunity to open the word of God, to speak the gospel. We're thankful that the doors of this hall can be opened. The invitations can be given to whosoever will come. And our Father, we do long that souls at this time will take advantage of the opportunity given. Father, we are debtors to mercy alone, as we sing. Our Father, we are grateful for those of us who know the Savior and enjoy the salvation that we have received. Yet, our Father, we think of so many who are out of Christ, they're without a Savior, and they're in great danger whether they realize it or not. Father, we do pray for help this evening to speak. We ask for blessing from on, on high in the Savior's name. Amen. Now, we're going to go to the beginning. We're going to go back to Genesis. It's not something that I would normally do to begin a gospel series, but we've been thinking about the need to set a foundation, the need to go to the beginning and get a perspective, a divine perspective on our lives. So we'll read in Genesis in chapter 1. It's likely a verse that is known by the majority here. And if not, we read very simply. Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Goes on to tell us that the earth was without form, it was void, it was empty, there was darkness. And the Spirit of God began to move. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light and so on. This is the first day of creation. You come down to uh, 26, you read of the creation of man himself. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle, over all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. And God blessed them. The book of Genesis, of course, is a book of beginnings. It's a book of origins. It really answers the great question as to where we come from, why we are here, and ultimately where we are going, even in this very first verse that we have read. It says, in the beginning, the beginning of God's creation, the beginning of the creation of the universe as far as mankind Himself is concerned. This is the beginning. In the beginning, God. You see, this is the beginning of all things. God himself. In the beginning, I take it that mm, we can appreciate something of God himself because even though this world had a beginning, God was already there. God himself does not have a beginning. God does not have an end. He, of course, is the one who created all things, as we read in this book. In the beginning, God. God was. God is eternal. But not only that, in the beginning, God created. We can appreciate that God is, is wise. He is the intelligent designer, the creator of this vast universe. I don't know if you uh, understand this or I. It's almost impossible for us as human beings but the, the vastness of this universe is something so awesome, we can hardly take it in. I was trying to do a quick search before meeting here as to how many stars are in the Milky Way. A billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. A billion. And the next question is how many galaxies are there in our universe? And according to Google, there's at least 125 billion galaxies. And God, the one who created all this, 
exists outside of this. He exists outside of time and outside of space as an eternal, all-wise and all-powerful being. This is beyond really human comprehension to understand who God is apart from his relationships and dealings with us as men and women. But he is the creator of this vast universe. He is eternal, existing, as I have said, outside of earth, outside of the universe, outside of space. He is not confined to time. You see, we measure time by our revolutions around the sun and the earth as it spins every day. But God has always existed outside of all of those things. And he is a creator of those things. He's a creator of time and sense and seasons and space and matter. He is a creator of all things. He is eternal. He is wise as the intelligent designer to consider that we do not live in utter chaos. So humanity might display that sometimes. The earth and its revolutions around the sun is something you can count on. That's why they make calendars every year because they know the order that's because God set it in that order that's how farmers know that they can plant in the springtime and get a harvest in the fall because God has established an order you see not only is God all wise but he is powerful because he is the one that made it God made everything that exists in this universe out of nothing his very spoken word. He didn't need help from anyone and he didn't have to borrow from anyone. He spoke and it was. As we have read in the beginning, God created. He created out of nothing. With the very power of his being, he could speak and it could come into existence. It says the heaven and the earth. The power of God is manifest in creation. Not only in the intelligence to design it, but the power to bring it about, to bring it into existence. In Hebrews chapter 1, it would tell us the one that sustains, that continually keeps things as they are, is God. Would you come down to verse 28, you also read that God is good. Very simply, when it speaks of the creation of mankind, maybe a theme for another night, but the Bible tells us that not only did he create men, but he blessed them. The very beginning of God's interaction with mankind is this, is God is displaying his goodness toward them. We didn't read of where God uh, placed man, but we know that it was a garden. It was perfect. It was really a paradise. Uh, everything that man could need was supplied by God in that place. Everything that God had made was ultimately for the enjoyment of man there. You think about it, that they had all of those good foods to eat, all of the fruits, and yet they didn't have to eat. They weren't going to die of hunger, were they? They weren't going to die at all. And yet, because God in his goodness designed it that they could enjoy his creation, he offers it to them. So very simply, what we need to understand is that God is the beginning of creation and ultimately God is the end of creation. You come to the last book of the Bible, speaking of the Lord Jesus, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. But God is the reason of creation. And this is something that ought to speak to you and I. God is a creator, and the reason that you and I exist is because of him. Now, you might say in the gospel, oh, this isn't something that really needs to be touched on, but I understand that we are constantly bombarded by other ideas. And the children that go to public school, you can't even turn on the television, a nature program, without hearing about evolution. You cannot pick up a National Geographic without reading about evolution. This is something that's propagated throughout the whole world. People denying the existence of this all-wise, all-powerful, and good God. 
We come to the word of God and it makes it plain. The reason of our existence is God himself. He is the one that created us. And what we as individuals need to understand and appreciate is the why, the purpose of God in creating us. Reason for creation. Because you and I as individuals, we might have purposes for our lives. We have purpose. We have plans that we make. Schools have plans and programs. Employers have their outlook and purposes for individuals. Work there, their employees. Governments have their plans and politicians have their agendas. And nations have their desire. But how many take into account the purposes of God? God is the beginning of creation. God is the end of creation. And ultimately, everything is marching according to the purposes of God. And here is a failure when you and I as individuals created by God do not take God into account. When we do not appreciate ultimately what is God's purpose for your life, for my life. Is my purpose here just to go to school and finish school? Just to get a good job and to have a home, to have a house, to have a family, to live and die? Is our purpose just merely to exist on this earth for a few years and then be forgotten? God is our creator and he created us as spiritual beings even as he is a spirit. God created us, so man was created, formed out of the dust of the ground, and he had a beginning. And I tell you that we do not have an end. We will have an end here on earth, but we are eternal beings traveling through the sea to one of two great eternal destinies. And that is what we are here to speak about this evening. In the beginning, God. The Bible makes it very plain for us that there are not many gods. There are many Eastern religions that would speak of many different gods. And through the ages of time, gods and goddesses, the great pantheon of all the Greek gods that they would worship. And yet the Bible tells us that there is one God. The Bible also tells us that he is not as some people would would, would proclaim the creation itself. This is God. This is another error that is held by mankind. It's called pantheism, that the universe itself is God. But God existed before the universe, as we have just read. This universe is not God. And I've met people, I've spoken with people, and they've told me this. I am God. You are God. That rock is God. Everything is God. You see, people have a very aired concept of who or what God is. There is one God, the God of the Bible, the creator, and ultimately the one that wants to be the savior of fallen mankind. There is one God. He is the wise God, the powerful God. He is the eternal God. He is the good God. He is a God that makes himself known. He's a God that makes himself known. We read that in creation itself, as Paul speaks in Romans chapter 1, he says that the invisible things of him, of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. God has given the testimony of himself, even in the things that are seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead. So that men are without excuse. Or maybe the psalmist would make it simpler. He could say it like this. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens would speak to us of the existence of God. The being of God. And even even ignorant people would have to confess as they look up into the night sky. That someone had to have made this. It's only the hardness of men's heart that would say no one means. You see, ultimately, the reason for this this idea of evolution, 
that men has come about because of chaos. It's, it's just a bunch of nonsense. But you want to know where it comes from? It's ultimately that men do not want to give account to their creator. It's going back to this principle. The reason of our being is God. You and I are not an accident here on earth. We're not a result of chaos, disorder, a big bang. We are not evolved from monkeys as animals living here on planet earth. There is a reason for our existence. We have been made with a purpose. I take it ultimately this purpose is to have a relationship with this creator. With this eternal God. With this all wise God. With this good God. You only have to begin to read through the pages of Holy Scripture. You'll find that he is a loving God. A God who displays his character, his care, his love, his desire for the well-being of mankind. This is a God that wants to have a relationship with men and women. You see, without God, what is life? What is life without God? It's empty. It's purposeless. It's pointless. And there are so many empty souls in this world trying to find meaning and purpose and pleasure in the things of this passing life. You see, a life without God is a, is a life that is ultimately empty. And there are people that might try to, might try and claim happiness without God. But I do not believe that true happiness can exist outside of God. The devil, yes, he does his work to try and keep people occupied with material things. But do material things really satisfy? Do material things really make a person happy? Do they give a person meaning and purpose of existence? And yet people strive for so many material things. And yet the purpose of our existence is this, is to have a relationship with this God. The God who is the creator of all things. Psalm chapter 8, the psalmist, he is in amazement. David likely as he is out in the night sky taking care of his father's sheep. When I consider the heavens, the moon and the stars that you have ordained, that you have placed, the work of your fingers... I begin to wonder at how small man is. What is man? But he says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? You see, God created man. And God has always desired to deal with men and to have a relationship with men. You see, the fact that, that, that in all of our minuteness that we could either, even, even pass to the mind of God, that God could even think about us or care about us. And David is amazed. He says, what is man that thou art mindful of him, that you have a desire for his well-being? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? You see, ultimately that is God's purpose, is to have a relationship with men. On earth? Yes, that is what eternal life is on earth, is a relationship with God. It's a quality of life in knowing, John chapter 17, this is eternal life that they might know, the one true God, in Jesus Christ whom he has sent. That is what gives purpose and meaning to life. But not only for our existence on earth but for all eternity to be with him to enjoy the eternal God the all wise God the omnipotent the all powerful the good God the God who is a God of love 
The glory of God can be seen in creation. The heavens declare the greatness, the dignity of God. But how much more his own presence to be with God. And yet, sadly, friends, we have to tell you, it isn't enough just to live and die and to hope that you will spend eternity with God. I want to read one more verse as time is gone. The book of Hebrews chapter 1. We could have read many more verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John chapter 1 attributes creation to the Lord Jesus as the one who created all things. And Hebrews chapter 1 also tells us that he is the creator of all things. Hebrews chapter 1, briefly. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Maybe we'll speak about this another night. It says, again, God. God. What is God doing? He is not creating, but now he is speaking. God, who in sundry times or in times gone by, and in different manners, he spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. And he says he has spoken these last days by his son. So he's speaking of the Lord Jesus, who he has appointed, appointed heir of all things by whom he also made the world. So the Bible tells us that the universe was made by the Son of God. He is really the one that implements all these things. He is the creator. He is the redeemer. He is the one that is going to execute judgment on this world. He is the one that is going to establish righteousness on this earth. He is the one that ultimately fulfills God's purposes the Bible says he has appointed him heir of all things. All things were created by him and for him. Let's just drop down here. Uh, verse uh, 3, we'll continue to read. Who being the brightness of his glory, the expression, the manifestation of the greatness, the dignity of God, the express image of his person, the one who has made God known. Here it is, the one who upholds all things. By the power of his word, the Bible tells us when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The creator is also the savior. It's a wonderful thing to think of the power of, self, uh, uh, the, power of, of the Lord Jesus himself in creation, as I've already said. He could speak. He could say, let there be light. And there was light. We didn't read it, but I hope you notice the sun wasn't created until the fourth day. But he could speak, let there be light and he could make light. He spoke the universe into existence. But in order for men that have sinned against God. To have their sins forgiven and be brought into a right relationship with God. The Lord Jesus, not only did he have to come into this world. Not only was he born into this world to live in this world. But the Bible tells us that he died. That it was through the shedding of his blood, speaking of his death on the cross. That he has brought about the purging, the cleansing, the forgiveness of sins. When he had by himself purged our sins. The purpose of our existence is this. Is to have a relationship with God. And only scratch the surface this evening. That relationship has been marred. It's been, it's been destroyed because of the entrance of sin for another night. But God is the one who has provided a means where my men and women can know that awful sin dealt with, put away, to have sins forgiven, to come into relationship with this God. The Lord Jesus Christ suffered there at Calvary with this purpose in mind, the forgiveness of my sins, the cleansing of all the defilement, the things that would separate me from God, that would separate you from God for time. And for eternity, the Lord Jesus provides salvation through his death on the cross. 
Listen as Brother Jesus speaks to you this evening of that word. Let's friend, to go back to where we began. A life without God is an empty life. And I tell you, an eternity without God is an awful eternity. And this is not God's purpose or desire. That is why his son shed his blood on the cross at Calvary to purge us, to cleanse us of our sin so that we might be eternally with him. I would like to read in 1 Timothy in chapter 1. If you have a Bible with you or an application on your device that would have the word of God, 1 Timothy and chapter 1, please. And again, it's a privilege to be here with you and to share the Word of God. We're thankful for all the those that have come physically uh, to hear the Word of God, and likewise those that might be listening on Facebook or on YouTube will give you a welcome as well. There's one verse in this chapter that I would like to read with you. 1 Timothy Chapter 1 and verse number 15. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 15. And I typically like to read the verse two or three times and give you an opportunity to look it over and think about what that verse is saying. So I will go ahead and read it perhaps two or three times. The verse says, 1 Timothy 1 and 15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Again, the verse says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. So the first part, he's describing the message or the saying. And then after the word acceptation, he states the message. So this is the message that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he adds, of whom I am chief. So just allow me to read it one more time. And you can observe that verse and think about what it is saying. And then we'll try to take a little closer look at it. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The purpose of these gospel meetings is to share a message with you, to share a message of salvation, a message of hope, a message of forgiveness, a message that would transform lives, that would change destinies. And that's what we will be trying to do each and every night that we stand before you and open the word of God. We're trying to share a message with you, hoping that you will hear the message of God and believe God's message. We've been hearing about God and the greatness of God and his desire to have a relationship with each and every one. And we are privileged to open the word of God and to share the message of God. I too today would like to perhaps lay a little bit of a foundation and using this verse, I would like to define some of the terms or the words that you might frequently hear throughout this gospel series. And three of the words we find in this particular verse or forms of the words. And just let me point them out uh, to you quickly and then we will Take a little closer look at each one of the three words. I would like to notice, first of all, with you, the word sin. You will notice that this verse speaks of sinners. And so I would like to speak about sinners and their sin. This verse also speaks of being saved. It says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And so I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the word saved and what it means to be saved. And then, perhaps most importantly, 
we'd like to speak about the Lord Jesus. The verse says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And so those three words are going to be central to many of the messages that we would be sharing with you. Speaking of being saved from sin through the Lord Jesus Christ. So starting with the very end, it might seem strange, but starting with the end where it's mentioned sinners, I would like to talk about sin with you for just a few minutes. The Bible obviously would teach that we are sinners, all of us, that there is not a man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. We all are sinners. But what is sin? If you were asked to give a definition or define sin, what is sin? It's not a frequently used word in our everyday vocabulary. It would be a word that would be confined to religious centers or taught in the Sunday school or in gospel preaching. And it would be very likely that in normal conversation with individuals that there would be many people that would not be able to under, uh, define what sin is or to tell us if a certain action was sinful or not. What is sin? Well, the Bible uses basically three words to describe sin or three different, I was going to say types of sin, but that might not quite be right. But there's three different words that would be used by the Bible. First, there would be sin, and then there would be the word transgression, and then there would be iniquity. And I want to take the time to define each one of those because I do feel that it is important to try to emphasize just how sinful we are. And, and we should know what the Bible is speaking about when it says that we are sinners. What is sin? Well, very simply defined, sin is missing the mark. It is not reaching up to God's expectation or God's standard. God, being the creator, as we have heard, has every right to establish his standard or his expectations as far as our behavior and our conduct and our character is concerned. And he has established a holy standard. And every time we fall short of that standard, we are sinning against God. And that is perhaps why it is so difficult at times to identify sin in our lives. Because we fail to recognize how often, how frequently we fall short of what God expects of us. We are constantly missing the mark. Just for those that are a little bit younger, one of the illustrations that is often used to describe sin or to define sin is you would set a target at a distance. And whether you're throwing a ball or shooting a weapon, you're trying to hit that target. But it's at, at such a distance that it's impossible to, to hit the target, to hit the mark. And some would fire their weapon or throw a ball, and they might get closer than others. But the target would be so impossibly far or small that none would be able to hit it. And the word actually means every time you would miss, it would mean sin. I've sinned. I missed the mark. That was the goal. And so God establishes his standard, his expectations for each one of us. And every time we miss the mark, we are sinning against God. If you want to think of it, uh, let me just give you perhaps an example or two. God has said in his word, for example, that we are to love God with all of our being, all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our entire being. We're to love God. So, so there is the bar that has been set to love God with every inch of your being and also to love your neighbor as yourself. God has established that bar, that standard. You might be able to say, well, I think I love God. You know, you remember in school when you had to graph uh, out a, a math problem or you had a graph set before you and you had to interpret the data. Now let's just say that there are three or four individuals and the, God, and the standard is here to love God 100%. With 100% of your being. 
And there's an individual here, and it's just a supposition. It's just an example. And that individual can say that he has loved God 60%. And another 30% and another 10. None of them have reached the standard. Nobody has reached that expectation. All have come short. And that's exactly what the Bible says. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody has ever reached that expectation. All have fallen short. A fatal error is to look at those different graphs, if you're following my example, and say, well, I, I've reached 60%, but boy, my buddy over here, he's only at 10%, so I'm way better off. It's a fatal error because you're comparing yourself with somebody else when you need to be comparing yourself with God's stand. So that is just a quick definition of what sin is. And the Bible clearly teaches that we have all sinned. What is trespass? I know we didn't read that verse or that word in this particular verse, but again, I am attempting to, to show how sinful we are. What is a trespass? Or a transgression, I should say. Transgression. The word trespass is also in the Bible, but and they're similar. But a transgression. What is a transgression? Well, let's just say that you go on vacation and you go to one of the, the state parks. And there's trails through the woods and there's many, many things you can do. But we're going to say that that state park is surrounded by private property. And so you're out exploring and having a good time with your friends and you're wandering through the trails and you come up to a, a fence and there's private property on the other side. And the sign says, no trespassing. It's clearly marked and there's a fence there. There's a line that is drawn and you understand that I am not supposed to cross that fence. Now you can come as close to the fence as as you can. You can come right up to it. You can look at it. You can read the sign. You can look over the fence and you can see the other person's property. The moment you step over that fence, the moment you cross that line, you've committed a transgression. You've trespassed. You've violated a rule, a law. The Bible speaks about our transgressions. God in his authority has established laws. Many of you in the Sunday school have memorized them. Some of the Ten Commandments. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Maybe you've crossed that line and taken his name in vain. Do not steal. God has established that line. He has drawn it in the sand, if you will. And many have crossed that line and broken the law of God. Do not bear false witness. Do not commit adultery. Do not covet. God has drawn his lines, established his law. And every time that we violate, every time that we break the law of God, we are sinning against God. We are committing transgression, actually. And so there is sin when we fail to reach the standard that God has established. There are transgressions when we violate the laws of God. You know, sometimes when you're out in the woods, it's very possible that you might wander across that line without even realizing it, right? You didn't realize that that was somebody else's property, that there was a sign there. You may not have seen it. And it's the very same thing in our lives. Often we might cross a line, transgress against God without even realizing it. Very quickly, iniquity is to, to live just a completely rebellious life. Lawlessness. With no regard to law, the law of God, just doing what we want to do, willfully violating the law of God, going our own way. 
sin. Now might be a good time to ask, are you a sinner? Do you consider yourself a sinner? Based on the, the small amount of information that I've given you about what sin is and what transgression is and what an iniquity is, do you consider yourself a sinner? Would you be able to examine your life and identify sins that you have committed, transgressions that you have committed? Would you consider yourself a sinner? Let me ask you this. Would God consider you a sinner? I think he would. I know he would. God would consider all of us sinners. For all have sinned. That is what we are. That is why we need salvation. And that brings me to the second word that I'd like to mention quickly. You, if you've attended gospel meetings for any amount of time or listened to gospel preaching, been to the Sunday school, undoubtedly you have heard the word again and again, you need to be saved, or the word saved and, and salvation. What does the word mean? What does it mean to be saved? Well, if you were to grab a dictionary or Google and type in saved, not speaking of the biblical context, but just typing in the word, you would come up with a definition more or less like this, that to be saved means to be rescued from harm or danger, to be rescued from harm or danger. I don't know if you saw it in the news. It happened, I think, just last week or perhaps the week before. A lady in Istanbul was uh, in a, an apartment complex on the third floor and the flames were engulfing that building and the smoke was billowing out from the windows and she had four young children. And she opened the window. Apparently the escape routes were blocked and she opened the window and a crowd had gathered at the, the foot of that building, at the base of the building, and they had stretched some blankets between several of the individuals and one by one, the woman began to take her children and to extend them out the window three floors up and drop them to safety. She was saving them from harm or danger. They were in danger of losing their lives. They were about to perish, engulfed in an inferno, in flames. And that mother... It must have broken her heart or with great fear, but she extended them out of that window and let them fall, and they fell safely into the blanket below. The word saved in our everyday vocabulary means to be rescued from some sort of danger or harm. Well, what does it mean then in the Bible when it talks about being saved from sin? It means exactly the same thing. To be saved from the danger of our sin. What might that be? What danger could there possibly be in living a sinful life and going on in sin? Well, first and foremost, there's the danger of sin destroying your life. Sin is destructive. And we'll speak about that, Lord willing, in other meetings, but sin will just devour and destroy lives. Just wreak havoc on lives of individuals. But there is an eternal danger, and the danger is of leaving this life without having your sins forgiven and going into eternity and facing the judgment of God and ending in eternal ruin, the danger of perishing in the lake of fire forever. So let me ask you, do you think sin is serious if God speaks about eternal judgment? Most definitely. Let me ask you this. I have asked you if you would consider yourself a sinner. Let me ask you now, do you think that you need to be saved from your sin? Rescued from going down to the judgment of God. Rescued from going to destruction. 
Do you think that you need to be saved? Would you like to be saved? We sure hope so. That's why we're sharing this message. Trying to make you understand your need of salvation. You know, there's a verse in the Bible and it says this, that God desires all to be saved. So whether you would like to be saved or not, God wants you to be saved. Let me just quickly bring this to a close, but I would also like to mention that the word saved indicates that you cannot save yourself. Right? By the very use of the word, it, it indicates that we cannot save ourselves. If I need to be saved, that means I can't save myself. Somebody else has to save me. You think of those four little children, and they were unable to save themselves. Somebody else had to do it. It was actually a group effort in that particular instance, the mother dropping them out, and those at the bottom that were there prepared to catch them, deliver them. But the Bible would then teach that I can't save myself. But this is the good news of what we are going to try to share with you each and every night in the will of God. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Number one, please notice who he came to save. He came to save sinners. Notice who he is that came. We've been hearing about God. And the Lord Jesus is the Son of God. God manifests in flesh. God who be, the Son of God who became a man with the express purpose of saving sinners. Oh, the time is gone, but consider very briefly what he did to save sinners, what he has done. He has died on the cross in the place of the sinner. He has taken the sinner's sin upon him, and he has borne the judgment of God on the cross to save sinners. I will close with this so that we can end on time. Two things very quickly about the Lord Jesus. It says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. There's a little song that we used to sing in Sunday school, and perhaps you still sing it, that he is ready, he is willing, he is able to save. Notice two of those words. He's ready. I want you to know tonight as we exit this hall that the Lord Jesus is ready to save you. If you are longing to be saved, know that he is ready. He is ready. Just as important, know that he is able to save. That he is able to save. Because it would be possible in a, in a scenario that we were talking about, an illustration that somebody would need to be rescued or saved from drowning or, or from a fire or something of that nature. And somebody would perhaps be willing, a parent would be willing to rush into that burning building. But it would be very possible that they would fail in their attempt, that they would not be able. I want you to know that the Lord Jesus is ready to save. And I want you to know that he is able to save. He is able to save to the uttermost, says the Bible, which means eternally, forever. For all eternity, he is able to save sinners. He's ready to save every class of sinner you can find. And he's able to save them from their sin, deliver them from the power of their sin, and deliver them from the penalty of their sin. And I close with the responsibility that the sinner has. To simply trust in the Lord Jesus. To place their faith in him. And that is why you can be saved tonight. Whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or sitting in this hall. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I am chief. If you trust him, you will be saved tonight. I will close in prayer and then sing a hymn before departing. Father in heaven, we do bow in thanksgiving for the word of God. We think of the creation of God and all of its splendor and glory. 
and the vastness of this universe and marvel again that God would desire fellowship with sinful man. We marvel at his sending this, his son into the world to save sinners. And we look to thee tonight that you would bless your word and salvation of souls, that there would be a longing to know sins forgiven and a longing to trust the Savior and that there would be salvation even tonight. Help us to sing a hymn in closing, we pray. We pray for the meetings as they would continue in the will of God. And we give thanks in the Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing number 52. Number 52. Again, we are thankful that you were able to join us for the gospel meeting tonight. And we do pray that you would be able to come back tomorrow night. And those that listened online as well, um, that they could join us online as, again tomorrow evening at the same time in all this week. Number 52, have you trusted Jesus and his saving power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? If anybody does have questions or there's something that we need to clarify for you, uh, we're always open to visit or talk after the meeting and, and to help clarify anything that perhaps we didn't make clear in the message. Number 52, and thank you very much for coming. Have you trusted Jesus in saving power? Are you lost in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace and song? Are you lost in the blood of the Lamb? Are you lost in the blood in the soul and in blood? Thank you.